Now, if you've ever taught toddlers, you may be wondering, why on earth do they do that? You see, I love teaching preschoolers and pre-K, but toddlers, they're an entirely different ball game. If you've ever taught toddlers, you may be wondering, why do they do that? Maybe you've even wondered, why do they say no all the time? Or why did they wander around the classroom? In here at Elevating Early Childhood, we get a lot of questions about toddlers. So that's why I invited my good friend, Devin Kuntzman, to chat all things toddlers with us today. Devin is the founder of the popular website, transformingtoddlerhood.com. She spent the last 15 years working with families and children across three continents as a coach, former nanny to high profile families, and director of an orphanage in Rwanda. Devin is on a mission to transform the myth that toddlerhood is terrible. She teaches parents and teachers that it's possible to embrace this sensitive developmental period while overcoming power struggles and maintaining your sanity. So Devin, welcome to the podcast. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to talk to you today about toddlers. Whenever I think of toddlers, I always think of you. So I think of you as the toddler whisperer. So I'm so glad that you came on to talk to us about this topic today because we have so many listeners out there who are teaching toddlers, or maybe they even have a toddler in their life, right? And I get a lot of questions about toddlers and especially teaching them. And one of the biggest questions I get is why do they do that? <laughs> so Devin, can you tell us some of the reasons why toddlers do stuff? Because, you know, I think about pre-K, like four-year-olds, like I know why they do certain things. And we know why kindergartners do certain things, but toddlers seem like a completely different animal. So Devin, why do they do things like say no to us all the time? Yeah. So let's start with the general question of like, why do they do that? Because Literally every adult that's spent time with a toddler at some point has thought, what is going on here? Why are they, they doing that? Like this is so true. So I think the first thing to know is that as adults, we're looking at toddlers and toddler behavior with a fully developed brain. Our brains are fully developed by our mid twenties. They're fully developed. And so we're able to access um, both the lower brain, the upper brain, our upper brain is fully developed, which means that we have a firm grip on logical thinking, uh, logical reasoning, planning, all these executive function skills that toddlers don't have well-developed or a lot of access to. And so when we're looking at their behavior, we're looking from an adult logical brain thinking, what is going on here? When your toddler is actually spending a lot of their time in their lower brain in their emotions, right? And um, in their different emotions and the big ones like fear and anger and excitement, and they can easily get overwhelmed and go into a stress response that we all know, bite, flight, and freeze. And so this is what, this is what even has us asking this question, because we're looking through a lens that toddlers can't even access. Um, and that's what has us thinking, what is going on here? Because toddlers um, just can't look at things from that logical place. So with like preschool age children, like children ages four and five, you know, we know sometimes why they're doing something, right? We have some kind of a sense. Well, at least I do as a, as a preschool teacher, but sometimes when toddlers do or don't do something, I'm like, what? Like, what? <laughs> you know, so it makes sense um, what you're saying. You say the sky is blue and they say, no, <laughs> like, why are they doing that? Yeah, well, we have to remember that there is one, I, I, I say there's one overarching goal of the toddler years, and that is to become an independent individual. So babies relate to themselves as an extension of their parents and caregivers, and often parents and caregivers relate to the baby as an extension of themselves. And then the toddler years start, and your little one starts uh, realizing that they are a separate individual and that they have an impact on the world and on their environment, including the people in their environment. And they realize I can think differently 
than mom or dad or my caregivers. I can do things differently. And so they start to realize that they're an individual. And so this whole process unfolds during the toddler years so they can develop a sense of self. So along the way of that, this is where we end up with the power struggles, the uh, no, and this is all in service of your little one discovering who they are as a person and developing a sense of self. And the way that toddlers do this is through experimenting and exploring. So toddlers' developmental drive plays a huge role in their behavior. And a big part of their developmental drive is to experiment and explore. Also, they have some other developmental needs, you know, to have a sense of power, to have a sense of control, to feel capable, things like that. But when you really get down to it, they're wired to experiment and explore so they can learn about themselves and their environment. And that's where all of a sudden we're like, what happened here? This little one who felt like an extension of me is now off doing their own thing. And so you have an agenda, your toddler has an agenda. And it's going like this. And this is where, you know, all the challenges and frustrations of toddlerhood start to pop up. Yeah. It's funny, while you were talking, I was reminded of a question that I asked some of our um, viewers and listeners recently. And that was, how would you describe the first day of teaching pre-K or preschool? And somebody wrote, well, of course, a lot of us said it's like hurting kittens, right? Like hurting them. And uh, somebody said, it's like shoveling smoke. And I was like, oh, I think shoveling smoke is more like teaching toddlers on the first day of school. Like they're even more difficult because they all have their own agenda, like you said, and none of their agendas match ours as the adult. And they're all just seeking input on their own. And there's no collective class, shall you say. So what do you think about that? Yeah, well, you know, here's the thing, like, because of where they're at developmentally, because they're developing a sense of self for the first time, and they have this strong drive to experiment and explore, that toddlers actually have a very egocentric view of the world and uh, egocentric way of interacting with the world. And this is not cause for alarm. This is developmentally appropriate. But then what that equates to, especially in a classroom environment, is, you know, everyone just so excited going everywhere. And it can be challenging to get everyone um, in one place all at the same time, because not only are they driven to experiment and explore, also toddlers are lacking, severely lacking impulse control, because the part of the brain that's responsible for logical thinking and reasoning, and it's also Uh, responsible for impulse control and emotional regulation and behavior regulation. And so that is very underdeveloped in the toddler years. And so that lack of impulse control is so strong. They're out doing their own thing and it's really hard to like get them back in and to focus. And it can be so frustrating. And this is where we make a really big mistake as adults by labeling toddlers as terrible or toddlerhood as terrible or toddlers as bad or even labeling their behavior as rude, disrespectful, all these things when toddlers are just lacking impulse control. They might even as they get a little bit older, know the expectation, be able to repeat back the expectation, but their impulse control is not strong enough to follow through on the expectation. So that makes me wonder, well, thank you, first of all, because that was very concise. I like that. But that makes me wonder then if maybe we shouldn't adjust our expectations of toddlers then if they're in a classroom setting and we're the caregiver or the teacher or even with our own kids, maybe our expectations are what needs to be adjusted. So this, this notion that they come into the classroom and they put away their belongings and they sit down for like a circle time or a morning meeting, like maybe that needs to change and shift a little bit. Now that we know more about how the brain develops and how children develop, what do you think about that? Yes, absolutely. I mean, the toddlerhood, toddlerhood is characterized by this strong expectation gap where us as adults, we have, uh, there's a gap in our expectations and what a toddler is capable of. And the reason this happens is because, okay, 
toddlers are extremely capable in so many ways, right? They're making verbal um, progress, leaps and bounds. Their physical abilities are growing immensely. So when we see them, physically able to do so many things and verbally able to communicate so many things, we start to think that they're capable of also controlling their feelings and emotions and therefore controlling their behavior because emotional regulation leads to behavior regulation. If the emotions are dysregulated, the behavior is going to be dysregulated because toddlers communicate their feelings and emotions and needs through their behavior. So when we have this expectation gap, it happens because we tend to under we tend to overestimate their um, emotional regulation capabilities and abilities. But what's interesting is we also tend to underestimate their physical abilities. So we find ourselves saying "be careful" all the time, or doing things for them that they actually could do because we want it to look a certain way, or it just saves time. Which okay. In some moments, we're going to save time. We're going to do it for them. But we tend to underestimate what they're actually physically capable of and then overestimate what they're emotionally capable of. And so this creates this big expectation gap, which can leave us struggling with toddler behavior. That makes so much sense. Wow. So let's say you're a parent or a teacher and you're having this this problem where the kids aren't kind of doing what you want them to or expect them to. Let's say it's, you know, the first couple of weeks of school and they're coming into the classroom and they're, again, it's like herding kittens, right? They're wandering all over the place. They're not going to want to come. They don't want to come and listen to a story or sit. They don't want to do the activities you have set out. They want to go to other parts of the classroom. So if you're in that situation with toddlers, what what could we do to shift our expectations? How could we do that without throwing away everything we've ever known or done? Yeah. Well, I think the first thing to do is just to slow down, right? Slow down, take a deep breath, remind yourself that this is not an emergency. If everyone is physically safe, then we can tell ourselves, okay, they're safe. I'm safe. This is not an emergency because our brain is perceiving some type of threat when we start, you know, getting worked up and want to uh, lose it. Um, our brain's perceiving a threat. And so we actually have to remind ourselves, okay, wait a minute. If everyone's physically safe and there's not an impending emergency here, then I can take a moment and this is not an emergency. I can just slow down, take a deep breath. And then the next thing to do is meet toddlers where they're at. So for example, um, if we're looking in a classroom setting and toddlers come in and you might have some toddlers that are fly through the door and they're just so excited and they want to touch everything and they want to see everything and they want to look at it, especially if the um, room is a prepared environment that changes each day. So there's something new out and this gets them excited, gets them engaged. And um, you might have some toddlers that come in a little leery and they're actually having trouble separating. You might get the other end of the spectrum, but either way, you've got a lot of kids with a lot of needs. And sometimes we want to start the day in a very organized manner where we put away our stuff and then we get out this and then we sit down for a circle time or do these things. So sometimes we have to one way we can meet them where they're at is to uh, reduce the number of expectations or transitions at the beginning of the day. As long as they're like coats get into the cubby, then let them have time to explore, greet each other, adjust to being in the room before moving into circle time. I know a lot of schools do circle time at the beginning of the day. And I've noticed that um, preschools that use circle time at the end of the day have a lot better results. Now, we have to first of all understand that toddlers, their attention span is very short. Like I'm talking somewhere around three to six minutes. And so circle time lasting longer than three to six minutes, they're going to be fidgety unless they're engaged. And the best way to engage little kids is to use more than one of their senses. That being said, though, if we use circle time at the end of the day, they're going to be less excited. They're going to be a little more um, adjusted. They're probably going to be a little tired and they're probably going to be able to sit a little bit longer and it's going to reduce the level of stress for everyone. So I really like that because, you know, 
maybe we should follow their lead is what I hear you saying. So if they are, you know, they're so egocentric, they come in the room, they're all for touching everything, wandering around, getting into stuff. Instead of trying to shovel that smoke or herd those kittens, what if we followed that lead and we let them do some exploration and some self-guided things when they first enter, because that's when they're bursting with energy, right? We all know that they wake up earlier than we do with 10 times more energy. So go with that and let that work for you. You know, because we here at Elevating Early Childhood, we're all about working smarter and not harder. So whether you're a parent or a teacher, I think it's really important to keep that in mind. And if that's the direction they're going in, like I have to come in this room and touch the stuff, then let's go there. And let's move circle time later in the day when they're like a little bit tired, you know, (laughs) maybe, maybe they've gotten some of their energy out. Maybe they'll be able to focus if they're not thinking about, I need to go touch this and I need to go touch that. And I need to get into this. Maybe that novelty of some of those things, even though they're there every day, you know, and, but every day they come in, they're kind of new to them again. (laughs) You know, I think that could go a long way in reducing some of the stress that our teachers and parents of toddlers are going through on a daily basis. What do you think? Oh my goodness. Absolutely. I mean, and sometimes, you know, I just want to preface and say that when we say follow their lead, we don't mean that your toddler is in control and calling the shots because now we're moving from one end of the spectrum, which I call controlling commander, where we want to be in charge and it has to look exactly how we want it. And there's no room for anything else to the other side where we might be dancing in the permissive pushover area. um, If we are, you know, letting the toddler be in charge. So following the lead is not, that's not what we mean by that. What we mean is looking at how you can meet a toddler's needs within your boundaries. And sometimes the boundaries that we set are based on some like ideal um, way that we'd like it to be versus what is. So you have to take a look at what is and what you can create that's within your boundaries from what is. And definitely observing children following their lead is going to let you know so many things. It's going to let you know what they're interested in. It's going to let you know maybe the order of how to like create the day. It might Um, let you know just lots of different things, how they're feeling, um, what their passions are, and just get to know what they need. And so observation is really, really key. And thinking about working smarter, not harder, observation is something that, you know, you don't have to do a lot of planning for. It's literally just being with them and, and making sure it's still within your boundaries, everyone's safe, but really letting them explore and sometimes even letting kids get outside earlier in the day too. You know, sometimes we save outdoor time for the middle or the end of the day. We, if we do that at the beginning of the day, that's going to help so much in just letting kids really fulfill that need to experiment and explore in all the ways. That's genius. I like that. Both of those things are going to be really helpful um, to move circle time later and move outdoor motor time earlier in the day, that's going to go such a long way in really kind of flipping this whole idea of trying to, you know, shovel smoke. I hate to say it again, but, you know, it's going to make things easier. I like to talk about it all the time. I I mentioned um, rolling the boulder downhill instead of uphill. (laughs) It's going to be a lot easier to roll it downhill. So let's do that when it comes to toddlers and and let, let that work for us instead of against us. And I think that going back to what you said about letting them take the lead, that doesn't mean letting them run the show. Like you're still going to have to worry about, you know, okay, we're not going to be biting. We're going to, you know, try to share a little bit. (laughs) That's another tough thing for toddlers too, but you know, we're still going to have parameters in place. We're not going to let them, you know, put their fingers in light sockets or anything, (laughs) but to lead the way when it comes to what is it that they're interested in right now? How can we harness that for good instead of evil, right? (laughs) Yeah, they really follow their lead to know what are they capable of and what do they need? I mean, that's what we're gonna learn when we follow their lead. 
just letting it be within our boundaries and also just re-examining our boundaries, our boundaries, you know, based on something realistic. Are they based on ideals? Are we, is it based on something we heard, saw on, on a movie, you know, like what, what is this actually based on and really look at, okay, well, here's my boundary. Here's what a toddler's capable, like my, what these toddlers are capable of. Cause they're going to show you people are like, well, how do I know what to expect? Well, your toddlers are showing you what they're capable of. And it doesn't mean that's the only thing. Of course, you can work on scaffolding some skills and building some skills, but it takes time because their brains learning and growing at such a rapid pace, but it's going, it's going to take time, but you just build on those. And so it doesn't mean we have to be resigned. Like, well, I guess it's just going to be chaos in here the whole time. It's, it's just, you know, we've got to work together with them and try, instead of trying to put them in a box, we got to like build the castle with them. Right. That's a great example. I love that. One of the many questions I get asked about toddlers from toddler teachers quite often is, I think that we're heavily influenced in the um, education world by what we see online, what we see on Pinterest, right? What we see in the media and these beautiful like projects, art projects or whatever, we're like, oh, the kids would love that. That's going to be so much fun. And then they get into it and they're like, oh no, like that didn't work out. That was a disaster. And so then I get the questions, well, how do I do this type of thing? You know, this, this art project or something, how do I get my kids to do these things and to do it well? And I think when it comes to toddlers, we don't get them to do a lot of things we have to, like you said, build that foundation. We have to scaffold. And also, I think part of it is that we're torn between what we see on Pinterest and then also the children's developmental levels. Like we, we have to, there has to be a, a meeting of the two because we have to ask ourselves, is what we're asking of them actually developmentally appropriate for their age or their developmental abilities. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, I can absolutely see how, like, yeah, you have this idea, whether you're a teacher, parent, caregiver, you know, you walk in, you have this cool idea, this project, this thing, it's going to be so fun. You're excited about it. And then you do it and the process, the end result, it looks nothing like what you envisioned. And so it's really easy to go to this place of feeling defeated or feeling like you failed or, you know, something's bad or wrong. Someone's not enough, you know, and it's really easy to go there. And my invitation to you in this moment is to, instead of being so focused on the outcome, especially the look of the outcome, focus on the process and what was gained or learned in the process. So first of all, we want to remember that practice makes progress, not perfection. So nothing's one and done. We can always build up the skills through practice, but you might want to take a look. Did the kids, because what did toddlers really need developmentally at this stage? Like they need to play, they need to experiment and explore. Were they able to experiment and explore with the glue and the feathers or the whatever, the paper and tearing the paper? Was there a tactile sensory um, experimenting and exploring experience that added value to their life? If so, this project was a success, even if you have a crumple of confetti instead of this beautiful piece of artwork. Right, exactly. As you were talking about that, I think that's just, that's spot on. I was thinking about a time when I moved into a new community several years ago and they were having a fall festival for the children in the neighborhood, right? And they were looking for volunteers to do crafts with the kids. And I, you know, eagerly raised my hand. I'm like, oh, I'm all about children. I think that'll be a lot of fun. And of course, <laughs> I kind of overcommitted because I didn't realize that all these children weren't going to be four and five years old, like the kids I was used to. They were going to be like 12 months to like 12 years. And I was like, oh no, how am I going to have a project or something, you know, at this art fair or whatever it was that can meet the needs of all those kids. And so I really racked my brain. And then I think I, you know, put out the message on Facebook, the panic one, help. And somebody reminded me, they're like, oh, kids love bingo dot markers. And even a 
toddler can grip it in their hand and smash it on paper. And I was like, yes. And so we had coffee filters and bingo dot markers and it was, everyone's was beautiful and different. Like, and they were just exploring and those little itty bitties had just as much fun smashing that bingo dot marker onto the coffee filter as the 12 year olds who were creating like flowers and butterflies and all kinds of beautiful things, right? And so that's kind of what I think you're getting at really is what they're capable of, right? Yeah, and the experience they had, like, did they did they enjoy themselves? Did they get to experiment and explore? So it's more about the experience. I think what I'm saying is it's more about the experience than the end result. And the experience is what children learn from. Was it a positive experience? Did they get to experiment and explore? And sometimes that's enough in the toddler years. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, what I noticed with the littler ones that would come to my table, they would come with their parents during this particular time. And... Um, I would notice that some of them would smash the bingo dot marker into the table, like in the whole table would shake like with force, you know, cause they didn't know what kind of force they needed. And I was reflecting on that afterwards. And I was like, that's something they learned like right there. Like how much force do I need to like make this mark on a paper? Like for a 14 month old or, or whoever, whoever it was, um, I think I ended up with 150 kids at this thing, if you can believe it. And I was like, that is a really great thing for a child of that age to learn. Like what am, what strength do I have and how hard do I need to, to push this thing on the paper to make it make a mark and, you know, holding the thing in their hand. I mean, that was a whole, like, that's what they got out of it. And the older children who were like 12 years old, they were having a great time talking to each other and creating things. I had pipe cleaners there. I, it was kind of like an open-ended craft station or whatever, but everyone took something different away from it. And I think that is something that we could apply to the toddler years. Yeah. As long as there's experimentation and exploring going on, there's learning going on. And that even applies for when a toddler is saying no to you. When a toddler says no, this is part of that experimenting, exploring. They're experimenting with setting boundaries, becoming a separate person. They're experimenting with your responses and reactions. They're experimenting with where limits and boundaries stand. There's so much they're learning, even in the moments where they say no. And so just knowing that this isn't something you need to take personally. It's not a direct reflection of you as a parent, caregiver, teacher. It's not a direct reflection. It is part of the developmental phase and it serves a very important developmental purpose for toddlers. Right. As you were talking about that, I was reminded of my brother. He was one of those active children and um, he really liked to get a reaction out of people. That was kind of what he lived for. He's still known for that today. But when he was really little, he really would embarrass my mom because every time we were out in public, he would do that little tune. You might know it, um, Devin, his beans, beans, the magical fruit. I know it. <laughs> and I think he did it. I mean, to me, I was a kid, right? I'm seven years older than he is, but I was old enough to know, well, he's doing it because it, it embarrasses her like, and she gets all flustered. He gets attention for this because then if he does it in front of people, they're laughing. My mom is like embarrassed, paying attention to him, trying to get him to stop. I'm like, this is, this makes perfect sense to me, people, <laughs> you know? And it, my mom was just so mortified. And, um, I think that that was, he, that's what he was doing. Like he wasn't, he wasn't doing it to be evil. He was doing it because that's, he was getting, he was looking for the reaction, right? Yeah. And also a lot of things in the toddler years, uh, it kind of brings me to like another thing that I hear often is like, oh, like they're doing this for attention. They're just trying to get my attention. And it's like, okay, we need to think about this and reframe it because actually humans thrive on connection without connection. Humans probably would waste away because we literally need connection to survive. It's like imprinted in us that we need connection with others and toddlers who remember we said they had they're very physically and verbally independent but they're not very emotionally independent because their um, um, emotional regulation skills are lower which means that they need our support to regulate their emotions and process their emotions and make sense of them so because of that they really need a lot of support from us and so yes they are going 
to make bids for connection. And so I like to swap attention seeking behavior to they're making a bid for connection, yet they don't know how to say, I'm having a hard time. I need you to help me. This is overwhelming. I'm feeling out of sorts. So they don't know how to ask and make that. I need a hug. A hug would make me feel better right now. They don't know how to ask for that. And so you're going to see these behaviors pop up as bids for connection because your toddler needs to come back to their safe and secure base, fill their love cup, their emotional regulation cup, get back to their equilibrium so they can go out and experiment and explore again. And this is a cycle that happens millions of times every day. Okay. Maybe not millions, but it can feel like millions and that it happens a lot of each and every day, but you'll start to notice as you get older, it happens less and less, or the amount of time they're out experimenting and exploring lasts longer before they come back and make that bid for connection. And so it's just a really, really important reframe that can be a game changer for how you relate to a toddler's behavior, which will impact how you respond. Well, I love that. I always learn so much from talking to you. So now I am shifting my internal thought processes to thought processes, I should say, to reflect this shift, which is it's not attention-seeking behavior, it's connection-seeking behavior. Would that be right? Exactly. I mean, just think about that. And for anyone who's listening, like think about what we place, like the meaning we place on it when we label a behavior as attention seeking, it typically has a negative connotation. Yet when we make that flip to connection seeking, oh my gosh, right away, I feel a shift like in the, in here in my chest, like connection, I just feel like an opening. Right. And so it, and definitely It shifts how we relate to the behavior and how we, the lens through which we're looking at a toddler's behavior has a direct impact to how we respond to it and how we respond to it has a direct impact on how a toddler reacts. And so this is by making these shifts up front, it's really how we break the cycle of the power struggles of just all the challenging behavior that shows up. And guess what? There's still going to be challenging moments. There's going to be challenging behavior. Toddlers are going to express their feelings, emotions, and needs through their behavior. But this makes a big difference in how you feel about yourself as a parent, teacher, and caregiver and how you respond to your little ones. Yeah. So before we go, I know that everyone out there, if you're a teacher like me, you're you're still going back to that thought of my brother chanting beans, beans, um, the musical fruit. What would you do then? If, if, if indeed we make that shift and we say, okay, he's looking for connection and he's not trying to make my life miserable or, you know, just get a rise out of strangers, what would you then, what would your reaction to that behavior be? Yeah. So I always say in these moments, you want to try to talk about the elephant in the room. So you want to like say the thing that's at the root. You want to try to like get to the root as fast as possible. You might say, Hey, are you trying to get my attention? You just cut to the chase, especially when you have a preschooler, you know, um, maybe a kid going in, in school age, like, you know, you want to cut to the chase and be like, are you trying to get my attention? And guess what? There's also moments where you can be silly because a bid for connection might be that they just want to play too. So you could always be playful back. But the more if you say like this, like, no, this is bad. Don't do this. It's throwing fuel on the fire. So I would either be direct and get to the root right away. Or I would like be playful and like move on from it without making a big deal about it. And if it's something that really persists, you might be, you might also get like um, curious, like, hey, what are you trying to say right now? Um, Oh, are you trying to be silly? Well, it's okay to be silly. And, you know, these words, they have this meaning. And so when you want to say these things, you can be silly like that in your room or in the bathroom. Those are when you're in private, these are where you talk about these. So you could also for like older kids, like give them a place where it's within your boundaries to say these things as well. But if it's a bit for connection, that's not going to change the behavior because really they're just trying to connect with you. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. I always learn so much from you, Devin. I want to thank you so much for chatting with us about why toddlers do that today. I know that it's going to be so helpful for all of our viewers and listeners. It was certainly helpful for myself. 
and um, tell us where folks can find you if they want to continue the conversation with um, the toddler whisperer. And I know that's not your handle that you go by, but that's just what I like re affectionately refer to you as. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah. So the best place to connect with me is on Instagram at transforming toddlerhood and on my website, which is also transforming toddlerhood. And um, yeah, I'd love to connect with you all. So um, you can tell I'm super excited and passionate about toddlers and love talking about them and really demystifying this age. So everyone can just have a lot more fun. That's awesome. Thanks again to Devin for joining us today. And thank you for listening. Um, until next time, I'm Vanessa Levin. This is Devin Vinsman, And you're listening to Elevating Early Childhood. Onward and upward.